Hello, my name is Dr. Stephen Ralston, and welcome to Clinical Ethics at the Bedside, a primer for the OBGYN. The goal of this lecture is to give the viewer a basis for understanding how ethicists approach dilemmas in clinical medicine. Our aim is not to turn each of you into a full-fledged bioethicist, but to give you some tools and the language that will help you discuss and solve some of the ethical issues we will be discussing at the annual clinical meeting in May. I think it might be helpful for you to know who your instructors are for this course. I am Dr. Stephen Ralston. I am a maternal fetal medicine specialist at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. I have served on the ACOG Ethics Committee and have been teaching medical ethics for much of my career to students, residents, and fellows. Dr. Ruth Farrell is a general OBGYN at Cleveland Clinic who is also a clinical ethicist and has also served on the ACOG Ethics Committee. She has devoted much of her career to bioethics. Listed here are the various boards and memberships that Dr. Farrell and I are disclosing. They certainly reveal some of our personal biases, but I hope we will be able to be as unbiased as possible in our teaching and instruction during this lecture and during our discussions at the annual clinical meeting in May. Daniel Callahan put it very well when he said, bioethics is a field of panoramic breadth and complexity. I think any of us who have worked in reproductive medicine over the past few decades understands that the acceleration of technology has created many complexities for us, and we have required new frameworks for thinking about bioethical matters so that we can most effectively assist patients, families, and other clinicians as they face difficult decision making. When we talk about the issues in this class, we tend to use a lot of language and words that can sometimes feel jargony, so I think it's useful to review some simple definitions. When we speak of ethics, we refer to moral principles that guide or govern a person or group's actions. The word is used commonly in describing a code of behavior ascribed to by professionals. Bioethics pertains to the study of controversial ethical issues that emerge from situations brought about by technological advances in biology and in medicine. And then in particular, medical ethics is the study of these issues, values, and morals as they apply to the practice of clinical medicine. Bioethics is informed by many different viewpoints and perspectives with analysis coming from many branches of learning. In the forefront have been medicine, law, and philosophy, but certainly theology, social sciences, as well as nursing and other allied health professions have added to the discourse. Ethics is never quite as simple as this, but this slide illustrates one simple structure as to how to navigate bioethical issues. If the only criterion for making ethical decisions was a risk-benefit ratio for the patient, our ethical decision-making might look like this. But in reality, things are much more complex. In clinical ethics, that more often than not, there's more than one course of action that may be morally justifiable. And it's most often not about what's right or wrong, but who the players are in a given situation, what their interests and needs are, and how we can come to a resolution. So it's not necessarily about good doctors and bad doctors. Instead, it's about a physician facing the complexities of modern healthcare and navigating in the ways that serve patients. This is particularly relevant in the setting of reproductive medicine where many of the issues we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis are provocative lightning rod issues for debate and have to do with most personal and intimate aspects of an individual's life. Paul Kamasaroff said, ethics is what happens in every interaction between every doctor and every patient. At my hospital, we like to say, ethics is everyone. So let's get down to the nitty gritty. How do you know if something is right or wrong? What makes something ethical? Well, you can ask people, poll them, and see what behaviors are supported by the community. This is called descriptive ethics. It is what is being done and what people think um, and do in the community. Ethicists, however, are more usually concerned about not what is being done, but what should be done. Uh, this is the normative choice, and it is more difficult and, I hope, more fun. Justice Potter Stewart, in his famous opinion about hardcore pornography, said this about pornography. I know it when I see it. 
Similarly, when we see unethical behavior, we often have a gut feeling that it is wrong, but explaining why it is wrong, justifying why we have come to that conclusion can be more challenging. In this cartoon, a group of students is cheating off another student during, ironically, an ethics examination. We see this and know it is wrong. Why is it wrong though? Well, the cheaters are passing off someone else's work as their own, a form of lying, which goes in the face of the principle of truth-telling or veracity. Cheating is wrong because the act of cheating or lying is unethical. Maybe it's wrong for other reasons. The cheaters may pass the test and be foisted upon the world as full-fledged philosophers, when in reality, they don't know what they are doing. The consequence of their being allowed to cheat is that unqualified philosophers will be graduated from this school, and to avoid that bad consequence, we must not allow the means that might get us there, that is, cheating. How you analyze the situation depends on how you frame the question. The challenge of bioethics is to dissect behaviors in clinical medicine, explain them, and justify why some behaviors are good and others are less good or even bad, and we use a variety of frameworks to do so. A framework in bioethics is really a set of rules we follow in analyzing a clinical scenario. And there are two major moral theories that underpin bioethics. These two are consequentialism or a consequence-based theory and deontology, which is an obligation-based theory. When we frame an ethical question by looking at results and determine the rightness or wrongness of an action based on the results of said action, this is called consequentialism. The results or consequences of an action are what matter. The ends justify the means. One well-known form of consequentialism is utilitarianism, a philosophy espoused by Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill. An act is measured by how much good it creates. This framework, however, does lead to some uncomfortable results. This is an image from the TV show 24 one of whose premises is that there's often a terrorist group about to kill thousands of people, and the protagonist does anything possible to avoid this, including torturing suspects. And torturing suspects, at least according to the writers of this TV series, is justified because it will save many lives. The means of torture is used to justify the end of saving lives. Now, this is not a framework we use very often in clinical medicine. We don't usually harm people on purpose because it will produce a great good. We wouldn't take someone's kidney against their will merely because it would save someone's life. The end is good, but it does not justify that particular means. Nevertheless, there are times in clinical medicine when the ends may in fact justify the means. Certainly in times of medical scarcity or disaster scenarios, this framework can help us to allocate limited resources where saving the most number of lives might be an end worth pursuing, but perhaps not the framework we want to use in all of clinical medicine. In some ways, the teachings of Immanuel Kant, deontology, is the opposite of consequentialism. It's not ends that matters, but the means. Actions are judged not by their consequences. Importantly, human beings should not be used as a means to the end. A consequentialist must, might justify doing research without informed consent if it would create tremendous good, curing cancer, for example. But a deontologist would not allow this because even though the end is laudable, the means to that end is not justifiable. So we have to look at the actions and judge the actions, not the consequences. For Kant, there are some actions that cannot be justified, for if everyone did them, the fabric of society would fall apart. Lying was one such action. There are several other frameworks that are used in clinical bioethics that I think are useful to review briefly before we delve into cases. Principle-based ethics, or principalism, is the framework that many of us were taught in medical school. This is a framework made famous by Thomas Beecham and James Childress. It says that clinical ethical dilemmas can be analyzed by seeing if actions and consequences are in line with the four pillars of biomedical ethics, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. Autonomy comes from the Greek meaning self-governance, autonomy. It is the principle that supports our consideration of the wishes and desires of the individual patient in our clinical decision-making. It is not what we want, not what the family wants, but the patient him or herself wants that should be directive in our actions. Beneficence and non-maleficence guide us in what we should be offering to our patients in terms of care. And it strikes a reasonable balance between doing good for the patient and doing harm to the patient. 
So we don't have to do anything the patient wants if we feel on balance it's not going to do enough good to justify the harm associated with the treatment. And finally, the principle of justice helps us to decide how to allocate scarce resources. And it also exhorts us to treat equally situated people in similar fashions. Virtue ethics frames clinical questions from the perspective of what a good doctor would do. Does the physician him or herself embody the ideal of a virtuous care provider? So it's not the actions necessarily nor the results, but the actor him or herself that is important. And these are qualities such as trustworthiness, prudence, fairness, integrity, compassion, and temperance. Care-based ethics, or the ethics of care, has its foundation not in rights or duties, but in the commitment, empathy, compassion, and caring that exists in the doctor-patient relationship. Responsibilities arise from these relationships, whether it's from the physician to the patient or the patient to the family. And consideration of all of these different possible actions on these relationships is important in making clinical decisions. Feminist ethics, of course, play a very special role in OBGYN. Here we have Gloria Steinem and Simone Beauvoir, two pillars of modern feminism. A feminist take on ethical dilemmas in clinical medicine would always take into consideration the historical power imbalances that have existed between the sexes. The role women have had in society and the relative lack of power women have in society may have an impact on how we decide what actions might or might not now be ethical, especially in the realm of reproductive ethics. The field of narrative ethics is related to feminist ethics in that stories, the histories that patients bring to the table are crucial in deciding what is right and wrong. It's not just important to figure out where a patient is, but how they got to where they are in order to make decisions about what actions might or might not be justifiable. For example, one could conclude that, the, that abortion in general is not justified, but in the setting of rape, when we consider this narrative, this experience of the patient, abortion might be justified. Finally, case-based reasoning uses accumulated body of influential cases and their interpretation to help provide moral guidance in the analysis of current cases. So we use our experience from things that have happened in the past to help us make decisions now and in the future. This framework asserts a great priority of how medicine is practiced over principles. So hopefully this brief review has not confused you more than is absolutely necessary. I think the real question is now, where do these frameworks take us? How do these frameworks help us make decisions? Well, all ethical dilemmas occur when there is at least two choices that are morally justifiable in the care of a patient. But of course, the answer to a clinical scenario is not going to be found by merely plugging in things into a formula. The first step always is to get good information. As my colleague, mentor, and friend Michael Groden has said, good ethics require good facts. We can't know what the right thing to do is if we don't know the reality of what the situation is. So always take time to gather facts and to think, to apply the principles that you know, and to talk to your colleagues. I cannot emphasize this enough that when faced with an ethical problem, do not be alone in that dilemma. Let your colleagues help you. Use professional organizations and ethics committees to help guide your behavior. This is a simple step-by-step -step approach. First, understand the situation, gather all your facts, Identify who will be making decisions and why. Establish the facts and identify all options of care. Evaluate the options based on the values and principles of those involved. And identify the conflicts. Identify the problem in terms of the ethical framework you're using. And then select the option that can best be justified. And then always revisit and reassess. Another way to look at this is just with a simple flowchart. 
once you've defined the problem and obtained all the relevant facts, figure out what the options are that are both clinically possible or recommended and then make arguments about which plan should be followed. Often there will be a parallel discussion about who the decision maker should be, especially when the patient can't make decisions for him or herself. And then key to this framework is to reevaluate after you have implemented your plan to see if you've learned anything that might help you the next time you face this scenario. When we reconvene at the annual clinical meeting, we will go over a series of cases that we hope will help illustrate this process. Again, remember that you are not alone in making these decisions. There are resources available to clinicians to help them navigate ethical challenges. Sometimes this is a formal ethics consultation um, that may be in existence at your hospital. Sometimes it's an informal consultation, an assistant from experienced colleagues. And sometimes you refer to professional organizations for their practice recommendations. In May at the annual clinical meeting, we will build on what we've discussed here and analyze a few cases. We will bring some of these cases from our own clinical experience, but we hope that some of you will also submit cases to us prior to the meeting. If you would like to submit a case, please email us at the addresses listed here. Thank you very much, and Ruth and I look forward to meeting you all in May.